Good morning, Northside. Please stand as we begin to worship this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story.
at Northside, we say welcome. We are glad you're here. Well, I got to meet several new um, people this morning, so I'm so grateful that you are here. I just want to share a couple of things that are going on here at Northside. So excited about what God is doing, and I don't have a list, so there you go. I don't normally do this. This is kind of cool. So excited about this. January, January, wow, sorry about that. It is coming, by the way. So excited in September, we're going to begin a new Sunday school class. Now hear me, I'm just going to go ahead and say this up front. It is not replacing, it is not taking away from any of our current Sunday school classes. We are just doing a very, very short stint. Um, 
And so we are going to be doing an eight-week class on hearing the voice of God. And I am so excited that uh, Pastor Denise Phelps and her husband Joe are going to be leading that. It's going to be a, a very, very short, but I'm telling you, I know it's only eight weeks. Some of you may want to cram 16 into eight. You know, you want to take it again. I don't know, but it's just going to be an amazing, amazing time. They're going to walk through uh, some journaling things. It's going to kind of coincide with some of the things that are going to be uh, preached from the pulpit as well. And so I am very, very excited about that. If you're interested, you can see me, Pastor Katie. You can see Pastor Denise as well. And uh, But just very, very excited. So if you would like to be a part of that, let me just say this. If you're currently in a Sunday school class and want to push pause on that class, go to their class for eight weeks and then come back and pick up um, with your class. That's great. If you don't come to Sunday school, what a great time to come. Is that nine, it starts at 9 o'clock. And, um, I mean, why wouldn't you want to start your day with Joe and Denise Phelps? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yes. You're welcome. Yeah. So come and be a part of that. That'll be an amazing time. Uh, also coming up, believe it or not, on the 10th as well, IYC, which is International Youth Convention. Here at the Church of God, that's the tribe that we belong to. And so they have... Uh, every other year, they have a thing called International Youth Convention, and it's where about five or 6,000 of your closest friends gather at the same time. Uh, this year, it's going to be actually in Orlando. It's a bunch of youth getting together, so there will be much excitement and much energy in the room. I will tell you, come and be a part of that. But if, you're, if your child or you're interested in your child or grandchild going to that, make sure, make sure, make sure that you go to this meeting on Sunday, September uh, 10th, following service. Pastor Hannah will be leading that, talking about... Um, different things that, um, yes. that are going on with that conference. That's going to be a great, great thing. So be a part of that. Last but not least, believe it or not, I, I don't know that I've ever been a part of a church that have had to ask for this. So this is an amazing problem. We we have babies all over the place. So I don't know if it's in the water here at Northside. I don't know what's going on. But we we need some. I know that the, the word up there is volunteers, but we need leaders. And the reason I say the word leaders is because it says train up a child in the way they should go. Now, they don't become a child when they're X amount years old, right? Why can't we start preaching Jesus and speaking Jesus into lives as an infant? It says, for you fairly wonderfully made me. You knew me before I was, while I was in my mother's womb. So let's go ahead and just inundate them with Jesus now. So if you would like to be a part of that um, very active ministry uh, in our church, uh, you can talk to Emma, you can talk to Pastor Katie about that, and we would love for you. It is not signing your life away. We are not asking you to now serve in the nursery for the next 40 years. We're just simply asking that you would come and help us. Um, if you don't like holding a baby, we'll have the altar call now, first of all. And then I'm just easy. Uh, but that's what you're doing. It's just speaking life over those babies, and you're able to hold them and uh, care for them while their parents are here worshiping Jesus. So if you want to be a part of that, please talk to Emma or talk to Pastor Katie. Lots of fun and exciting things that are going on in the family of God. And so we're, again, glad you're here. Ushers, if you'll make your way forward, we're going to take these next few moments, continue our worship as we get to give. Uh, it's an honor, it's a privilege to give um, and to be obedient to what God has called us to do. Um, again, I hope that you see this as part of an act of worship this morning as we have the opportunity to say, wow, Jesus, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your family. God, we want to honor you in all things. So, Father, thank you for today. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so, Father, we have come to this time this morning where we have the opportunity, the honor, the privilege, the joy of giving back to you. And so, Father, out of, uh, out of our obedience, we give to you because you've been so faithful, God. You've been so faithful, and so we want to be obedient with all that you have given to us. We want to be good stewards with all that you have given to us. And so, Father, that's why we give back to you. So, Jesus, multiply these tithes and these offerings for your glory, for your honor. We lift high the name of Jesus. We exalt his name and his name alone. And, Father, we are just so grateful. We are so grateful to be a part of this amazing kingdom called the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind. My comfort, my 
shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the
been forgiven If you've been redeemed Sing the song forever to If you walk in freedom If you bear his name Sing the song forever to
you reign forever, Jesus. I know some would say, gosh, Pastor, why do you keep singing those songs? Why do you keep singing the same words over and over and over? Because it says in Hebrews that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, then that means we're not fixing our eyes on whatever's going on in our own lives. Or whatever the things that have to go on this week or whatever's overtaking us. It says fix your eyes on Jesus. The author and the perfecter of our faith. I am so glad that I now have the faith of the that there is one who is perfect. He's the spotless lamb that was slain for each and every one of us. But don't get so fixated on the slain part. He's the only one that's resurrected. And that's why we give him praise. That's why we sing. We give you all the glory. Not some, not most. We give you all the glory. So we praise your name. We give you all. Thank you for this day that you have given to us, God. That the, the grace and the mercy that you've given to us, God. And Lamentations, when it says, Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah to your name. God, that we don't have to live off of yesterday's bread, but there's new manna for us today. And it's in your word. It's buried in your word. And so, God, what an opportunity, a privilege it is to, to get to dig in and find what you have for us today, Father. We're standing in your presence, Jesus. We know that you are going to be faithful here this morning. So God, in advance, we go ahead and thank you for that. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. Thank you for the way that the word is going to reach out to us. The God, the, the way it's going to bring revelation to us today. We exalt the name of Jesus and his name alone. We declare his majesty over these next few moments. You are worthy to be praised. We fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah. God, even in the midst, I know that there's there's such great excitement and celebration in our voices right now. But Father, I I, I, I pray for those individuals who who perished yesterday just in our own town. God, we live in a wicked, wicked world. But but there is a resurrected Jesus, a resurrected Lord, who is God, even there's wicked things in me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord. Jesus, I claim by your stripes we are healed. Maybe physically, God, we need to be healed, but oh God, there's some nasty junk inside of us that needs to be cleansed. Cleanse us whiter than snow, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name. You are the one. You are the only one. God, that's why I love in John where it says seven times, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. Oh God, wherever we're at in our, in our lives, Jesus, may we run to you. No, God, we don't have it all together. know the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. And that is who we place our trust in. That is who we place our hope in. We praise your name, Jesus. To you be the glory. To you be the honor. Now and forevermore, amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated, church family. I got to sit, y'all. I am constantly reminded of that thing where 
D.L. Moody gets so overtaken by <coughs> the Holy Spirit, he looks at his worship pastor. His worship pastor's name got a weird name, Ira Sankey. His mama didn't like him, but that's all right. Uh, but he was on his way traveling. I'm going to dismiss our kids in just a second. Hang oh, on. Sorry. But he was traveling, and he reached over, and he grabs Ira's arm, and he said, I've got to lay down. He said, Pastor, are you, are you ill? What are you, are, what's going on? Are you this, that tired? He said, I am so overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. I have got to lay down. I pray this morning, maybe you need to lay down. I don't know, but, um, but I just pray that this, in this time that you will be so overcome by the Holy Spirit and know that He is real and alive and well. And um, wow, that's why we worship church. Amen. Let me just say this. If you are in kindergarten or under, kindergarten or under, you are dismissed. All of our kid, kindergarten or first grade and, and above, stay here because we've got a, uh, several things that we want to talk through and we want them to be a part of that. But if you are in kindergarten, physically, by the way, um, if you are in kindergarten, you are dismissed. We have got some amazing ladies and leaders that want to spend time with you and pour Jesus into you. So if you're in kindergarten, you are dismissed. The rest of you get to stay here and be with us as we call it, in big church. Well, I'm so excited. Um, we have a friend of Northside that is here with us this morning. Um, I, I didn't realize as I was processing this week um, how long I've known of him, but then also known him, and then we've had some a couple other uh, interactions. But we, we are so blessed this morning to have Richard Fields with us. Richard is uh, a missionary. Um, he has a microphone already. <laughs> These guys in the back are just so good. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, Richard, would you make your way up? Uh, would you make welcome, family? This is my friend, Richard. And uh, he has um, an amazing ministry. I just found out that he's only been in, he's been in this ministry um, for 31 years. He started when he was two. And so, there you go. And, um, but he has an amazing ministry um, to two specific places that are... I, Dear is not even the right word, mm -hmm. just um, embedded, I think, probably into your heart. Mm -hmm. And that is the country of Haiti, and then also the very, very, very large country of India as well. And um, so we, we have the joy, we have the honor. Please don't think, oh, there's no preaching this morning. There is preaching. We're actually seeing a live preacher um, of, of what God's gospel is doing. And so we get to unpack some of those things this morning. So don't check out because, oh, here we go, there's another missionary guy. Um, this is going to be an amazing time together as we just kind of dialogue together to see what God is doing. And by the way, just side note, we support as a church, we support Richard and his ministry. And so now you're actually seeing what your dollars go to and who they go to, um, but more importantly, what they go to. And that is ministering to um, some amazing, amazing individuals around Haiti and India. So my friend, welcome. So... You're welcome to have a hot seat there. Um, tell us, I, I kind of already spilled the beans, but you know, where, where and what do you do? And I know you have a video you want to share with us, so you can cue us on that. But just tell us what's going on um, with you with Haiti and India and some of those things that are going on there. How that started? Before that, can I say something? Sure. Okay. <laughs> it is so great to be here, guys. Gosh, it's been a few years since I've been here. And then this is like a coming home type thing. I mean, this is wonderful. You know, Daryl and Roberta are very close friends. And so I'm thinking I get to see them. And gosh, and, and John and Wanda are here. And they've been to Haiti. And so, I mean, it's just great. You know, and, and Pastor Aaron and his wife, I didn't expect that. You know, I, I hadn't kept up with him where he went and stuff. I kind of lost him. Then talking to Daryl and Roberta, and I found out he's pastor here. Whoa, this is great. <laughs> you know, and then Julie. Julie, I know her father from West Virginia. West Virginia is where I'm from. And I met Julie. You might have been that tall, maybe, in that area somewhere when I first met Julie. You know? and, so, and then to beat it all, Bishop Renee Evans. Whoa! Yeah. 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 And his wife. Yeah, man. Yeah. I haven't seen Bishop Evans for years. He yeah. and uh, 
uh, Greg Wines and myself, we did things together all the time. So, you know, when he came, I, mean, I saw his wife first. I said, how do I know her? How do I know her? Uh, and I said, she just looks so familiar. Then when Pat, Bishop Evans came in, I said, that's how I know her. It's his wife. Yeah. So, man, what a joy it is to be here, dear uh, my friends. Uh, my, uh, just thank you for blessing me already. What a worship service, huh? Amen. Wow, man. Wow. That's great. Yeah, and what the old saying is, if you wasn't getting your fire going then, your wood is really wet. Yeah, you're really wet, so thank you. Okay, um, I'm Richard Fields. I'm the founder and director of Helping Hands in Motion. Um, God called me into this. I went to Warner Southern and then um, I pastored a little while, and then God said, I've got something special for you to do. And then we started this ministry uh, to uh, minister to indigenous people so they can reach their countries for Jesus Christ, to Amen. empower them, to give them the tools, the resources they need so they can reach their country for Jesus Christ. And, and at the time, see this is 1993 guys, and at the time they weren't talking about much helping indigenous people. And I'm saying that's the way to go because it's going to come to a point when the uh, missionaries from uh, United States or wherever else won't be able to get there and do the ministry. So we need to train and teach and empower the indigenous so they can continue the ministry when we're not there with Amen. them. And so we've been doing that for 31 years. And like Pastor Aaron said, we work in Haiti. In Haiti we work with a little orphanage. Uh, it's up in the mountains. Uh, it's south of uh, Port-au-Prince. It's a whole 21 miles from the airport, but it takes about an hour and a half, right, Daryl, to two hours to do that 21 miles. Yeah, it's uh, the roads. You could say is a little challenging at times. Yes, uh, it's not like the interstates here in Jacksonville, so it's very challenging. And and there we have an orphanage and stuff. And there we have right now we have 16 children, and I'll get into more stories about that in a minute. But God is really blessing us, and I, and great ways and I'll tell more about that in a minute and so we work in there and then, that started in 93 and then in 98 um, there was a professor at Warner Southern his name was uh, uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Clark he had been a missionary in East Pakistan uh, in the 1940s which is now Bangladesh and he said Richard you and John Bodecker you remember John don't you yeah. Pastor, the bishop, yeah, yeah. remembers John Bodecker and John and John, and they said we want you to go to that part of the world to see if y'all can help that country. And, and I, I'm a West Virginia boy, guys, huh? Uh, I, I I can't even speak English very well. <laughs> you know, and again, God took me to to Haiti, and I can speak Creole. And then He took me to our side of the world. I said, "Come on, God, they got ten languages over there, and then a bunch of you know side languages from from that." And I said, "No way!" But He said, "Yeah, I want you to go there and help them. I want you to empower these indigenous." leaders, these indigenous pastors, these indigenous congregations so they can reach their country for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we work in India and the country's kind of around India. And I'll share more about that as we as he gets questions for me and I'm a, I, where I can just solidify and, 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 and expand a little bit more on each thing. But God, you know, God is doing miraculous things. Yes, and yeah. and I want to yeah. tell you something. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I want to tell you something. You know, COVID was hard, very hard on all of us guys, but I want to tell you some stuff what God was doing during COVID, and it's wonderful. Yeah. How's that? Does that start? Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Let's turn our attention to the screen just real quick. You have a short, short video so we can kind of watch and, and see a little bit of what um, your travels, and not necessarily travels, but some of the ministry that you've been doing, okay. some of the people that you interact with, some of the places that you have to go. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I heard about was, um, and you, if I steal your story, I'm sorry, I'll, steal it. I'll tell you later. <laughs> but, um, one of the things that Pastor Richard, when he goes to India, um, again, when we talk about here in America and in Florida and in Jacksonville, we live in a great, great state. 
Um, and we talk about persecution and we talk about suffering. And we read that in the Bible and so we say, God, what is that? How does that apply to me here? And I know we don't really have a huge grasp on that. But most of the time when Richard goes to India, he is in long pants, in long shirt in India where it gets kind of chilly, doesn't it? Um, in, in a long shirt, in gloves, in a full mask, normally when he's on a helmet, and none of his skin is exposed. You're, you're saying, well, Pastor, and that's probably because of the heat. No, it's because of the danger that he is in by being a white man in India. But the Jesus inside of him is bigger than what's going on on the outside. The, the, and I don't want to say this word because I know it gets abused a lot. I know we say the calling. But I'm going to go one step further. The assignment that God has placed on a guy named Richard Fields said, I want you to go to India. God, I don't know what I'm doing in India. I have to wear clothes so that I'm not killed. God, I got you. I got you. I don't know 10 plus however many languages. God, I got you. I know what languages are. <laughs> and so um, so I just want you to know that's some of the things that, that um, our friend is doing to make sure, hear the words, to make sure that the gospel is advanced. Amen. And that to make sure that these people um, not only know Jesus, but also share Jesus like only they can do. Amen. Because again, when a white dude walks in, everybody says, well, he's just a white dude. But when another person comes up to you and says, hey, I, what's going on in your life? There's something different. Well, I can tell you about what's going on. Amen. So if you will turn your attention to the screen, there's going to be a real short video, video and we can see kind of some of the things that Richard is doing.
Bishop uh, Evans, you saw some of those pictures that you missed because Greg wanted you to go a long time ago. <laughs> Andy with me. I, I was getting ready to say something. I was invited to go, and uh, it's not for everybody. No. It's not for everybody. No. But uh, my question was, what do y'all eat over there? <laughs> <laughs> and so when Greg and Richard told me, I said, that don't sound too good. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and this was serious stuff. Yeah, it sure is. And sure uh, is. I said, uh, 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 what about when y'all go, where y'all go to the bathroom at? And uh, after talking about that for a little while, I said, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there's so many things that we could unpack and we could be here for another six hours and probably still never sure. unpack. Um, I know we saw some of those things probably on the screen, but what are some of the joys that you see in the ministry that you're doing in Haiti or India or both? Um, just um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that you see a lot and you saw that in the video is the amount of children. The investment in children and the investment in the adults there. So what what are some of the joys that you're seeing um, yeah, in the ministry that you're doing now? Wow. Wow, where did I start? Gosh, Daryl, where did I start? You know a bunch of them too. <laughs> uh, well, probably, see, we not only work in the orphanage uh, in this little village up in the mountains, and I'll watch what I'll say. I probably won't say names of towns or pastors' names and stuff like that because this will go on the Internet later. And then uh, people that could take it and bring persecution or danger upon uh, my friends um, would be terrible. So I won't probably say names and locations. So you'll just say, if you want to know names and locations to put to your prayer list, I've got a little table sitting up out there. Come to me there, and, and you won't even know how to spell most of them. So I can help you spell it, and you can write it down, put it on your prayer list, put it on your refrigerator in your bedroom or whatever, so that you can be praying for these people. Uh, but the, but the, I want to tell you the name of the orphanage. Um, but the orphanage is, um, it's up in the mountains and it's just, it's, a, it's a, in a secluded place and God knew what he was doing when he put us there. Um, it took a little bit of time to get there. We were down in Port-au-Prince for years and then we were able to move up in the mountains. And um, it's been great. It's been great because uh, in the town, in big towns, sometimes it's hard to minister to everyone. And up in that small village, we could minister to more people. Uh, we, we minister to those kids. And what is great, guys, uh, you saw one lady on there towards the end. Um, and she's Haitian, had you know, black hair, black skin. And I think she had a blue and white dress on. Uh, that's Tanya. And Tanya was one of the first kids that came to the orphanage. And now Tanya is the director right. of the orphanage. Yeah. She's, yeah, amen. Yeah. So she got married, they have three kids, and they run the orphanage. It's all indigenous ran. And so, you know, and I'll get into some stories about what's going on over there right now later, but if I, we, as Americans couldn't have stayed over there because the government was saying get out of there with what all is going on right now. And so they were there. And and she is one. We've got kids that have grown up in that orphanage and they become pastors. Uh, they become worship leaders. Yeah, yeah. They become school teachers. Yeah, yeah. They've got in the um, uh, health field in different e areas. Right. Uh, they've worked for the Haitian government uh, to do some things. Um, and, and above all of that, you know, I, 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 I can tell more, but above all of that, 
they work in the local church because they grow up in the church as children. When, when they come to the orphanage, they're children. And as they grow up, and as, as when they come, they go to church. Amen. And Sunday morning, guys, when Daryl can tell you, Sunday mornings is a hopping time at the orphanage because every one of them is getting up, getting dressed with their best clothes that they have, and they're heading to church. Mm. And, and church over there is not an hour long. Yeah, mm -hmm. Church over there, two to three hours long if you're going to go to... You know Sunday school and then stay for worship service and everything. It's just a and it's it's a joy to see these kids grow up and and what I tell them and they just don't understand it sometimes. I say, guys, you are going to change Haiti. Amen. I'll never change Haiti. I'll help you, but I'll never change Haiti. Amen. You will change Haiti. They go, but Richard. They call me Richard. Sometimes they call me Pastor. But, I love just being called Richard. And they go, Richard, no, you're the American. You're the one getting the money. You'll change Haiti. I said, no, no, no. You don't get it. This guy will not change Haiti. You will change Haiti. As you grow up and you follow the Lord and you get a job and you get in, in, involved in the government and involved in what's happening in Haiti and take your Christian values into Haiti, you will change Haiti. Amen. And so they, they see that. And then as they get older, you know, they get, they get, as they get older, they start seeing it. And they say, Richard, you know, you're right. I can change Haiti. If I stay here in Haiti, get a good Christian education, and get a good education, I'll be able to change Haiti. Amen. And so we encourage them. So that's the, one of the big things. And then the next thing after that is, Working with the local churches, you know, uh, probably in this little village where we're at, there's probably seven, eight churches, and um, everybody walks to them, and uh, Daryl has been with me to two or three of them, and the one we attend the most is down below where the orphanage building is at, and we go down there, and you'll walk up and you'll see two, three cars there. You'll see two, three cars there. You go, oh my gosh, nobody's here. You walk in, there's three, four hundred people. Wow. They all walk to church. Wow. They all walk to church. And, and, and they wouldn't be sitting like this. Not at all. No, uh-uh. They start from the front row and they work their way back. It fills up. And they got pews. Now, they don't have chairs where each, for each individual person they got pews. And they crowd in there. They put a, they, in a pew, if it was this long, they may have 20 people in that pew. And they just crowding and sitting in there. And they want to get up close, and they want to hear what's happening. And so we have been able to help them. We've had, uh, and, and, and I keep, I'm sorry, Daryl, keep, uh, y'all would talk to Daryl about this too, but I, I'm pointing at Daryl about, and Wanda and John, I think they know a little bit about it too. But we, we do a lot with the churches. We Every year we, before COVID, we try to have a vacation Bible school, and we'd have three, four hundred kids, you know, in that area. And so we was reaching out to those kids through the church. And what happens is that brings them into the church, and you know how it is. You bring the kids in, who's going to follow? Yeah. Mom and Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, all of that stuff. And so it's just wonderful to see how the church grows. And and, um, and then with our pastor down there, he is uh, uh, Pastor Renee, Pastor Aaron. Y'all would love him. He's an evangelist. And man, he gave his, he went through a rough time in his life. God healed him, brought healing in his life. Mm -hmm. And he started with one church, and he has probably 12 or 13 churches now that he has planted. He keeps telling, he and I talk every, about it every week. We're, we're texting, but not texting, but messaging each other back and forth. And he goes, uh, he calls me Pastor Richard. He goes, Pastor Richard, you will not believe what happened this week. And lots of times I don't. But about every week there's someone getting saved. Amen. And, yeah, amen. amen. And every week, they're, they're baptizing people, you know, and yeah. it is just wonderful to see it. And what happens is, you know, if, if it depended upon me or, 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 or Pastor Aaron or Pastor Renee, 
we wouldn't be over there right now because it's too dangerous. And what? To put the church on hold? No. It's indigenous. We've empowered the indigenous. We've encouraged the indigenous to continue on. And so, you know, um, my pastor, he'll get a hold of me and he says, Pastor Richard, he goes, you know, we're going to have a, um, a teaching session. We're, and he said, we're going to bring the pastors from around the, 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 the different communities. And, uh, and I say, how do we help? I said, we can't be there because lots of times I used to take pastors there to do a teaching and training. That's not happening now. So I said, well, how do we help? He said, well, we've got to feed them and take care of them for two days. So we send food, and we send money for food, and they buy food there. And, and when the pastors come, and when they, their wives come, and lots of times they're sleeping on the church floor, guys. They're sleeping on the church floor. Might be a mattress thrown down or something, and they're sleeping on the church floor, or the pastor may have 10 or 12 people sleeping in, in his house and stuff, and people around in the community has got people sleeping in their house. And, and, it, and it's just awesome. And, you know, not long ago he had um, a marriage seminar. One day was women, one day was men, and then one day was couples. And I said, how do we help there? There again... Richard, we got to bring them here and we got to feed them and take care of them. How do we help? I, I said, he said, money. And I send them money. And so what's good is God has kept the uh, avenue open to get the funds to them. Right. And he can take those funds and he can help the community. And the, com the community is getting stronger. When we first went to that community, the voodoo drums were happening just about every night. About every night, Beryl probably remembers when we first went there, the voodoo drums were loud and strong. Every night you would hear them from some area or another. Now, it's just maybe once in a while you'll hear a voodoo drum going off. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. That's right. Praise the Lord for that because voodoo is one of the things that uh, kind of controls them. Because once they get saved, see, they follow, most of them have followed voodoo and the witch doctor for a long time. Yeah. And see, and then the witch doctor comes to them and he says, oh, you got saved, huh? You better still give me money. Or you still better give me some food or something or I'll cast a spell on you. And then... Just like us all, we'll get sick every once in a while. We'll get a cold or something. And then when they get a little sick or a cold, the witch doctor will go to them and say, See, you didn't give me nothing, and now you're sick. And it brings fear upon them. And, and so it takes a while. But man, when they break free from that and realize that Jesus... Yes, amen. And when they realize that Jesus is the Son of God and He is stronger than any witch doctor in voodoo, it is just glorious, guys. It's just glorious. And they turn to following God, and when that witch doctor comes around, they'll say no. And we've even seen witch doctors, guys, give their life to Jesus Christ. It's great. It's really, really great. Um, in India, it's kind of the same thing, but different. In India, there's a lot of persecution to the church and to the people. And so uh, we're about empowering those pastors to take the gospel message out. When we first went there in 1998, um, we took, we took uh, teams of pastors and they did training sessions. And I'm not talking, of, I'm talking about new pastors, guys. You know, I look around in here, probably we got third, fourth, fifth generation Christians oh, here, amen. right? In your homes. I'm talking about first generation mm. Christians, guys. And they don't know nothing about the Bible. They have turned from a religion, one of the greater religions, they've turned from it, and they start following Jesus Christ. Mm. And so they know nothing about the Bible. They know nothing about Jesus Christ. And so it takes discipleship. And training. And, and guys, it's just one. And see, it, they, you know, when you get saved over there, when you get saved over there, it takes about a year to two years before they'll even baptize you. Because when you get baptized, 
That's an outward experience of something that has happened inwardly. Right. And what happens is it's gonna it's gonna happen in a pond. I can see crick here, can I? Everybody know what a crick <laughs> is? Okay. Yeah. You know what a crick is, Renee? Oh, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. Well, Pastor Renee Bishop and Renee, you can in a crick or somewhere they're gonna they're gonna baptize people. And then what happens the community sees it mm -hmm. and maybe mom and dad sees it and didn't know that their son or daughter had given their life to Jesus Christ and then that means persecution is going to come upon them yes, yeah. we've got a brothers and sisters that's had their parents try to kill them because they've turned from the religion that their family has followed for centuries mm -hmm. and they tried to take knives to them hatchets to them and everything else to try to kill them and they, they have been discipled for two years. They've been baptized, and they're ready to give a witness. And they Amen. give a witness, guys. Amen. That's the greatest thing. That's the joy. Yeah. Yeah. Don't look at me. I, well, I'm just enamored. I mean, I'll, I'll tell more. I know you, you will. Just tell me what to do. Yeah. I don't know how long we're going to go here. We got to walk one, two, one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's interesting that, um, oh my gosh, I just, I don't, I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear the joys, mm -hmm. but also in all of those joys that you were sharing, we obviously see, uh, some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I hear what you're saying in that whenever someone, um, accepts Christ, they literally give their life, their full life to Jesus mm. because um, they will be excommunicated from their family. Yes, that's right. They will be physically, um, mentally, verbally uh, abused. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are definitely put in the hot seat at that point. Um, so maybe what are, just to share a couple of challenges that you know of, maybe not that we've already that you've already unpacked a little bit, maybe current ones like as of you know August twenty seventh. These are two very large challenges, maybe in Haiti, maybe in India, maybe both. That we just we can as a congregation and family members pray for, uh, and then also be challenged maybe to support or whatever the case. But what are two challenges you know of right now? Uh, what well, or twenty two, whatever the case may be. Let me give you. A, I'll try to do a few. Okay. Um, do Haiti first. What's yeah, what's I'm do Haiti first. A few yeah, I'm in Haiti. Haiti first. Um, with Haiti, um, I don't know how many of you are keeping up with the news or not, but the gangs are have taken over Haiti, especially around Port-au-Prince and the areas around Port-au-Prince. They've even made their way up to where uh, the orphanage is at. So before they ever made their way up there, I was sending out messages to our prayer partners and say, pray that... The, there'll be um, the, the the orphanage will be invisible to these gangs when they come around, or they'll look over at it and they'll see these nine, ten foot sentinels standing around it, and they'll be afraid to go to it mm -hmm. because these gangs were going into places and they were uh, shooting things up. They had guns with. Uh, automatic weapons with multiple clips of ammunition and then they were burning things down and said Lord we've asked you to take care of that and so right now one of the challenges have been that um, probably four months ago something like that maybe uh, they got close to the orphanage and it was in night time kind of evening time and um, we was afraid it was going to get around the orphanage and see what they do um, if you're from America and you would go over there, they would want to take you hostage because they can get more money out of you ah, as a cute. ransom. And so they're going to do that. So the next best thing is find out where Americans support or help people. So like our orphanage. You know, they, they, they all, if they would find out and see that how well it's doing, they say well, Americans has to be helping this place for it to be doing as well as it is. And so what they do then, they, they take someone hostage from inside the orphanage. A kid, 
or uh, one of our staff or something take a more and then they, they they'll start with a ransom like a million dollars and then they'll they'll start and then you just start saying I don't have a million dollars and they'll just start working it down until you come to a, an agreement on yeah. um, onto on a price uh, um, our director and his wife I mean there are director and her husband uh, they have three children and um, this has happened a few years ago. Uh, there were some people came in and took her, their daughter hostage. Hmm. And they asked for a ridiculous amount of money, like a billion dollars, and no way. And I forget what we finally came up with, and, and they agreed to it. Hmm. And so um, then um, they said, okay, we'll let your daughter loose. They didn't, you still don't know if they're telling you the truth or not because they have killed people. Uh, they haven't let them loose, and I don't want to tell you all the atrocities that has happened with these gangs. And then, so, uh, they said they'll let her loose, and we're watching your home. You stay in your home until we let you know where we let your daughter off. So, like, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, they got a hold of our director and her husband, and they had dropped their child off, which was about six years old at that time, in downtown Port-au-Prince mm -hmm. at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it takes us, like I told you, the airport is an hour and a half to two hours to get there, to back and forth. And normally, even at two o'clock in the morning, it'll still take a half an hour to get down there. So our director's husband, he jumped in his vehicle and he headed downtown fast as he could. And he found his little girl there, wandering on the streets, looking for his. So it's a reality to us. We know it, and it's brought a lot of fear. And so people operate in fear, and they don't know what to do from there. And so, you know, we try to ask people to pray for us. Pray for this orphanage. And Tanya got a, got a hold of me the other day and said, the, uh, the gangs are back around. We're going to have to move the kids again. Uh, we moved them once, and then we brought them back when things calmed down. And now, then, but then, now that's calmed down again, we said, Pray the Lord, praise the Lord for that. So just pray that they'll stay away. Pray that things will calm down. Um, um, Kenya, Africa is going to lead a coalition of, of uh, people to, to come in and help resolve the gang problem. Um, uh, Haiti, the, the, the leaders of Haiti has agreed that Kenya can come in and bring some other people to help <coughs> lead a coalition to clean it up and get it straightened down, get it calmed down again. And so it's really, really rough. And so we pray that you'll pray with us about that. Um, and then with our pastors and stuff, um, the second one in, in, um, in Haiti, uh, our, our pastor that I told you about, that he and I are close and we write back and forth. This, he sent me a message on Thursday. So this is just three or four days old. He said, Richard, the gangs have attacked an area and attacked a couple of our churches. He said, everybody had to leave. He said, they, they have went to a place to stay safe. He said, I've got to feed them. I need to feed them. I said, well, how many are they? He said, Richard, I don't know. There's a bunch. That was kind of was his words. There's a bunch. We just need to feed them and take care of them. I said, okay. And so um, we're preparing to send them some money. And see, that's the good thing. See, I couldn't be down there. You couldn't be down there. But they can get the money. And then they can go to a store and see, and not only are, are we empowering the indigenous, we're helping the local economy by purchasing things from there, not carrying it down and stuff. They go to the local store, they buy the groceries, and then they feed the people. So uh, next this week, Monday, probably tomorrow, I'll send him some money and I'll say, here, use this, see how it does. And we'll go from there. So that one just happened. That one just happened. And Tanya contacted me about two weeks ago. Said the gangs 
quit saying that name. Uh, about two weeks ago, um, that we have to clean the kids out, uh, get them out of there again. But but it kind of calmed down, and they're, so they're staying around. They're staying in the orphanage, and we're we're pray for us that um, when when you build a wall, and our whole compound's got a wall all the way around it. I could have pointed it out to you in the picture. Uh, we got everything's built on a hillside because everything in Haiti is on a hillside, and you would have seen stair step wall all the way around it. That's the orphanage. And but when they build something and it gets so high, they got to build scaffolding. And then when they build scaffolding, they don't have scaffolding like we do in America. They got to they've got to get two befores and stuff and just nail something together. And then what they do. Daryl can tell you, you've got a brand new wall, then they knock a hole in it so that they can have one side back inside of the wall and the other side of the scaffolding out here on a makeshift uh, support. And then they get up there with the scaffolding so they can con continue building the wall higher. But what happens is when they knock those holes in the wall, it gives access for somebody to stick their foot in there and their feet and climb the wall and climb over it. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing right now, we're trying to repair all of those walls and all of those holes. And so that when they can't use those to get in and access us in any way. And then, uh, Daryl, no, 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 you're going to get tired of me telling your name, but we got a, we got a, a back gate to the orphanage. We don't hardly ever use it. Gosh, it's rusty and stuff, but we've painted it and tried to keep it clean a little bit. But um, what we want to do, we haven't done yet, we just talked about this, is uh, we're going to make a, a door in that big old gate. And then one of our, uh, a couple of our staff will know where the key's at for that door. And then if the gangs would come in during the night or during the day, the kids would have an escape route to get out. Yeah. And we've already talked to some people in the community where the kids could go and hide. And so we're trying to make plans and ways and and it, you we don't think about that in America we don't think how do I I gotta make a escape plan you gotta make a escape plan no, only one thing we can start thinking about is if a hurricane comes around then we say oh where do we go what do we do for a hurricane they have to think about it all the time because they never know what's going to happen um, and then um, in India I'm not going to tell you a couple of stories, but I just want to tell you what's been a, some some joys that has happened, um, and some things that have happened recently that has just been wonderful. Um, see, India itself is the one third the size of the size of the United States. So India is like from the Mississippi River over to the east coast of the United States. So about one-third size, okay? United States, what we have there, all 7.9 million people living in America, somewhere around there, okay? In India, in one-third the size of the United States, there's 1.3 billion people living there. It's just crazy with people everywhere. I've got pastors that says, come to my little village of Calcutta and visit me. There's just 20 million people that live here. Yeah. And so um, what has happened is during COVID, um, doors opened up because uh, the government was helping the richer people. Yeah. The, the, the people who had... It's a true had money and had had authority in India and they wouldn't help in the poor. And so the Lord opened doors up, guys. It's just unbelievable to where we could reach people for Jesus Christ. And there and I'll tell a story maybe later if I have time. But we were able to reach people, you know, kids and uh, uh, senior citizens for Jesus Christ, where they had been left and no one was taken care of. And we are feeding them and taking care of them in a way that only the indigenous, there again, only the indigenous can do it because I or you could never get into those areas where they're at. 
So that's a little bit. I can keep going on. I got to stop. <laughs> I got to stop somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As I've been listening, and um, hopefully you've been listening with your physical ears, but then also listening with your spirit as well. And the fact that I, I hope that you heard the significance behind what Pastor Richard said, and when they build these walls, and that there there is a small foothold. Did you hear that? So that the enemy can climb up mm -hmm. and then can get in and do enemy-like things. Mm -hmm. So what are they trying to do right now? They're trying to repair and close those holes up. Obviously, there is very quickly a spiritual you know, connotation we come, up to, come uh, with that. We have to be on our guard, family. Mm -hmm. um, the director is constantly calling him and saying, Pastor Richard... The gangs are moving in. The enemy is pressing in. We've got to fill these holes up so that they don't gain access to our children. Um, and so, again, I say to you, and I'm not trying to spin it around to a preaching moment, but oh my goodness, I hope you heard what Jesus said right there. That we have got to be on our guard. Um, do not let the enemy have a foothold. He said it, not me. Richard said it, not me. A foothold so that the enemy can climb in. Um, I'm also reminded of the, the scripture in John 16, you all know this, we say this a lot. But I have told you these things, Jesus said, because they're in red. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he says the infamous words, or those, those words that we hear all the time. In this world you will have trouble. And if you stop there, that's a horrible thing to say. That's it. Well, thanks Jesus for the encouraging word there. <laughs> but he doesn't stop there, does he? In this world you will have trouble. But. But take heart. And here's the thing I was even talking about earlier. No one else can say these words. No one else can stand on these words. Um, and, and be confident in saying these words. Uh, except for Jesus. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. And so therefore whenever you say that to someone from India who says, but I don't understand that, Pastor Richard, because I've always been of a certain religion that my great-grandmother's grandmother's 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 grandmother has always believed in. I'm going to have many trouble. But then Jesus says, but take heart. But take heart, director of uh, the orphanage. Um, even though there are footholds in the wall, this place is protected and surrounded by the um, army of God and is being undergirded even from America or wherever else you all have people praying for them, um, it's being undergirded by prayer by, by the saints. Amen. And so I, I will say, and obviously he can say, um, you know, pray for our um, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should, um, and I believe that. But we also need to be thinking and praying for ourselves as well because very quickly the enemy can walk in and, it, and you all know, it's always something dumb. It's never, it, not never, but most of the time, it's not some big grandiose thing. It's just a little foothold. Richard, really, is that what they said? Is that really what they meant? Well, they, and you hear what he said? In, in India, they walk in what? Shame. Well, that's, that ain't in here. There's no shame in here. There's hope. There's encouragement. And so now that's what he has the joy, the honor of instilling into people. But I hope that you're being challenged this morning, not just to hear what's going on in our family members that live in Haiti and in India, but also as a, as a family member here. Oh God, please help me. Please protect me. Please let me be led by your spirit. Please let me listen to, and I was going to share some things, but this is way, way better. Um, Please let me be attuned to what your spirit is saying. Please show me where there are those footholds that I can say, oh God, I can't fill that, but you can through your grace and through your mercy. Fill that, Jesus. Protect that back gate that nobody sees, Jesus. God, those black, dark spots that are in my heart that I want to, to, to hide, please reveal those and bring those to the light so that I may be protected in you. Um, and so, I, hopefully I can speak for my other family members. Know that this congregation is going to be praying for you. <coughs> know that this congregation is going to be praying for uh, the orphanage and those babies and the director and her family. Um, because 
the enemy may not come at somebody directly, but he'll come somewhere. Um, for all of those new converts in India, you know, knowing that I'm going to be excommunicated, I'm going to be disowned, I'm going to be left out by my family member because I know that Jesus is calling me to uh, live in his glory and his majesty and all of those things in the midst of, you know, Jesus says, leave your father and mother and follow me. In India, for real. For real. Take up your cross and follow me. Yeah, but Jesus, you know, just do it. Is it going to be hard? Absolutely. But take heart. Take heart. Because I've overcome the world. We, um, we don't just talk about prayer here. We believe in prayer here. And we don't just say that we're going to, oh, that'll be a great thing. We'll pray for you. We do it. Um, and that's something that we're trying to live. And so we want to pray for you. And um, when do you go back to Haiti or to India? It's according to what happens with the, okay. with the gangs and the yeah. persecution. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I'm sorry. It, it, it's according to when the gangs get settled down in Haiti and the persecution in India. I've tried to go to India several times and because of um, the persecution and because of COVID. It seems like some of the breakouts in COVID starts in India or in that area. And they get new, um, what's it called there? Yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, see, that's my West Virginia. I don't even know. I don't even know how to say that word. But anyway, um, and, and and so they get it started in there, and so then they say, Richard, no, you can't come now. And now they wanted me to come in October, but I got something else going on in October, which you know about. Yes. And then I can't go right now, right? Yeah, because of that. Yeah, it's one reason or another. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how the enemy tries to yeah. think that he's in control of all things, yeah. but he got nothing. No. So, well, I'm going to take that microphone from you. Okay. I am going to ask that you come stand in the middle right there. Okay. And according to the Bible, it says, if any of you um, needs anything, I'm going to read that scripture because sometimes we often say that if they're sick, in which it is, but in James chapter um, Five, no, help me, wow, had a senior moment there, y'all. Um, there we go, it is James chapter 5, thank you Jesus for that. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray, we've already done this. Is any of you, it says, is any one of you happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Thank you, Julie, for leading us in that Amen. this morning. Amen. Is anyone among you sick? Now, we often, oftentimes we always say, that means, must mean something physical. It could. It could be something physical. But there, we know there are other ailments as well, don't we? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them. Uh, in the name of the Lord with oil. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then here's the kicker. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to ask family, if you feel so inclined to come forward and lay your hands on Richard, we're going to pray over him and pray over the ministries that he's a part of, um, you missions people, if you'll come. But if you feel so inclined, uh, we're going to pray for him. We're going to um, send him off, and then we will be dismissed. I said call on the, on the elders. I think that James also meant the youngsters as well, because... Some of us are older than others. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the way that you have moved in this place like only you can do. And thank you for our brother in Christ who, wow, is, is walking through some pretty amazing things. And we just get to hear about it. But God, he's living in it. And so first of all, God, we pray a hedge of protection around him. We ask that you would place your angels on all four corners of his property. God, we know that the enemy would love to take out Richard because he is just advancing the kingdom like nobody's business. 
But we come against him when we put him on notice that say we say not today. Not today. Because the joy of the Lord is his, is his strength. And he chooses to put on the full armor of God each and every day uh, so that he can be used mildly by God. So the Lord protect him in ways that we don't even know about. Father, for the director in Haiti right now, wherever she is at and wherever their family is at, God, we ask that you protect him. God, that there would be angels guarding, guarding the corners of that property right now, of that orphanage. And um, the footholds, God, I pray for money to come in, um, that they have no idea where it came up. And those footholds for the enemy will be filled. God, if you want to miraculously go ahead and fill them now, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, we'd be excited about that. Um, but, Father, we just ask that the money would come in, that that would be um, just be taken care of so quickly that even Richard's going, I don't know how that happened so fast, but God does. Because, God, we know that you are the God of the impossible. And so we thank you for that. Nothing is impossible with you. So protect that place. Protect that director and her family. God, we come against uh, those gangs that are wanting to hurt people in those villages and those babies. We just come against them. God, I pray for guns not to work. That ammo be, uh, there would be no ammo. That, that um, things would just be blocked. Father, in your name, in Jesus' name, we ask these things. And God, I pray for my fellow brothers and sisters in India who are, man, they're facing persecution. But God, I just want their faith. <laughs> Help me to love you like they love you, God, just with every fiber of their being, no matter what, that they take up their cross, God, and follow you daily, God. May that be my heart posture as well. Protect them, Jesus. May they be lights, as you have commanded us to do, to go, God, and be Matthew 28, 19 people into all the world and preach the gospel, no matter what. Father, thank you for this ministry that you've given to this young man for these 31 years. Continue to give him a burning passion for the things of you and that your kingdom would be advanced through him. Bless him, God, in these next few months as there are some exciting things that are going to be happening. God, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. It is a joy. It is a joy to be in the family of God with him. And God, we speak, we speak blessings over his life now. In the name and authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray these things. Amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Celebrate God this morning, church family. Hallelujah to His name. Well, Pastor Richard, we thank you for being here. Again, family, if this is your very first time here at Northside, welcome. Please make sure that if you did, um, let your children go to the other um, building, that um, you go back and get them up. And uh, otherwise, they're coming home with us, which is fine. But, you know, if they're babies, we don't have diapers and formula and all that kind of stuff. But um, know that you are loved. Um, you're welcome here. And uh, we are so glad that you've come to worship with us. It's not by accident that you're here. It's by divine appointment. So walk in His grace, His mercy, and be blessed. You are dismissed.